thank you so much for joining me today as we talk about a movement of God called Neighboring. What I hope you walk away from this breakout session with is some resources and tools that you can take back and you can start doing immediately. Some ideas that you can share and you can have others walk with you through this. I'm so excited as we journey together today to be able to share how building intentional relationships can change your life and someone else's life for the kingdom. In 2001, um, my husband and I purchased our very first house. We had a, a two-year-old rambunctious toddler and a little newborn baby, and we moved into Chestnut Ridge subdivision. Um, we were so excited about it, and we lived there for about three years before we moved away to Russia. Right before we moved, um, our next-door neighbor um, told us she had just purchased the house, and she told us that um, our neighbors previously, whom we lived beside for almost three years, um, had gotten arrested because the husband was a drug dealer, and we had no idea. And so that whole family was broken, and in that brokenness, God revealed something to me that I could have been a better neighbor. It wasn't until 2004, till we went overseas to Russia as missionaries, that God taught me one of the most important lessons of my life. He taught me what my true mission field was. You see, I lived on the fifth story apartment in a apartment complex, and there were three apartment buildings with a little divor, which is like a, a playground in the middle. And my kids played there. We met mothers and, and families and babushki there. And um, God really taught me how to reach out to uh, a neighborhood there, even though it was an apartment complex. I remember one time my, my kids were playing on the, um, in the playground, and I was upstairs cooking or something um, in my apartment. And a, a little bit later, in comes Michaela with her new little friend, and then her little friend had her mom. And her mom was speaking English to me, um, and she said, I met your daughter, and she spoke per perfect Russian. And she told me she was an American, and my daughter told me she was an American, but I didn't believe them until I met you. And now I believe you because, of course, my Russian was a lot more Southern twangish <laughs> than my daughter's was. So you see, I built relationships through natural connections in Russia. In 2008, we came back. We, lived in, um, we live in West Columbia now uh, in South Carolina, and we looked for um, a house, a subdivision to move to that would be our intentional mission field while we were here. Um, our mission field now has 110 houses. That's our neighborhood, and we love those people so much. I love Angela, who lives on my street a few houses down. She's an entrepreneur, a fashion designer, and during the quarantine, she, she put all of that aside to start making masks. The Hannahs across the street, their daughter is my son's best friend, and we love uh, decorating cakes together for bake-offs. Um, you've got next door to me, Nazarene, who she just loves helping others, and she'll give you the shirt off of her back. And same with, um, with Sean and Marianne, two doors down. Um, at Easter, we needed a, a photo booth for our outdoor drive-by Easter gathering. And uh, she hand-painted this gorgeous, gorgeous sign that said, He is risen. And y'all, I'm telling you about my neighbors because they impact me. And I hope that I impact them. And that's because those are the people that God has surrounded me with. Those are, those are the people within my sphere of influence. There probably was a day where knowing your neighbor's name wasn't unique, um, but today in our culture, it is unique because um, we, we somehow transitioned and shifted our culture from the front porch to the back, uh, backyard. And that um, has hindered us building relationships with our neighbors. And so knowing their names, y'all, is so important is so important um, because you want to have genuine conversations, genuine relationships so you can get to know them and have 
long-lasting relationships. The objective in knowing my neighbor's names is not to get them in church. Now, I know that may shock some people, um, but that is not my objective. My objective in knowing my neighbors, not just their names, but knowing them, um, is so that they will know the Lord and have a lasting relationship with them, so that they will, um, through me and my relationship, get to know him in a personal way. Um, so my first question for you today is, who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? There's a lawyer who asked Jesus this very question in Luke 10, 25 through 37. Um, we call this parable the Good Samaritan. And I know you're probably extremely familiar with this, but I want to read it to you. And I want to point out something that really struck me um, in a few minutes. I'm going to read it to you. Um, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, said, but he desiring to justify himself, and said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he said to him on his, an on his animal, set him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. So looking at this passage, according to God's word, what is the problem? The problem is that a man was going from one town to the next. Now that was about 18 miles. And then he got attacked. Okay? They took his clothes, they beat him, and they left him for dead. That's a problem. The next problem, a priest and a Levite both Jews and relig religious leaders did not stop to help the man. They just continued on their way. So what's the solution? A Samaritan stopped to help the man. Y'all, Samaritans and Jews were enemies. They were despised by Jewish people. Yet this man, who had been mistreated, and even abused by people, his entire life stopped to help. He noticed. He took time out of his own journey to stop and help. And then he even used his own resources to help someone he didn't even know, a stranger. Now, it's important to note that Jesus didn't really answer the lawyer's question outright. He didn't say, well, your neighbor is those who live closest to you or your friends. No. Jesus responded by asking a question of his own. Who proved to be a neighbor to this man? He asked. The lawyer answered, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus responded, do likewise. So y'all get this, get this. In this passage, Jesus didn't answer the question of who. He answered the question of how. 
which we know is to show mercy. So to, to answer your question of who is your neighbor, based on this passage, y'all, everyone is our neighbor. Everyone we come in contact with. So those are who you live with. Those are who you live near. Those are who you work with. And those are who you play with. Those are your friends. We call this our sphere of influence. These are the people that God has intentionally put in your path. These are your, this is your mission field. This is your discipleship circle. And so to apply this today, I want to um, look at a little activity. It's a little worksheet for you guys to do. Um, it's called 321GO. We use this at the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And it's just a, a quick, cool exercise for you to see who is within your sphere of influence. So the first thing you need to do is you need to identify five names of people who you live with. And then identify five names of people who you live near. These are your neighbors. And then identify five names of people you work with. And lastly, identify five names of your friends. And after you make this list, I want you to take a second and I want you to look at each individual name. And I want you to put a cross beside the names of those you know have a relationship with Jesus. And then I want you to put a question mark beside the names of the ones that you're just not sure or you know that they don't have a relationship with Jesus. This is your sphere. Now it broadens as you go and serve in different places in your community or eat um, or get gas. You can always add those names as well, but this is your sphere of influence. I want you to take a second and I want you to just pause and I want you to pray and just say, God, can you help me identify three names in my sphere that have a question mark that maybe you want me to start praying for them and look for ways to care for them and then intentionally share the gospel with them? I want you to do that right now, if you will. I also want you to look at this, this um your sphere, and see if the Lord speaks to you in a way that says, you know, something I notice is I don't know any of my neighbor's names. Or all of the people on my list are saved. I don't have anybody that's far from God on this list. Or maybe there's no one that, maybe everyone on this list looks like you. Maybe that's something that the Lord says to you. So I challenge you to pray and ask God to reveal to you what he notices about your paper. So why do we neighbor? Why do we neighbor? We neighbor to show the love of Jesus Christ. We want to help. We want to serve. We want to give and we want to share. That's why we neighbor. Now, I'm getting to the meat of this, the very practical meat of this, which is how do we neighbor? There's three main ways that we neighbor. The first way is we pray. Y'all, every movement of God begins with prayer. Let me say that one more time. Every movement of God begins with prayer. Prayer softens hearts hard hearts. Prayer draws people to Jesus. God is the one that prepares these hearts and lives of those that we encounter. Um, I encourage you to prayer walk, to prayer walk your, your neighborhood, to prayer walk your community. You can do this in person or you can do this virtually. There's a great tool, a great resource called blesseveryhome.com. It is a map 
of your neighborhood. You can be a light in your neighborhood, and it will give you the names of those neighbors that you can specifically begin to pray for them if you haven't met them. And then there's also a way to care for them and share just to show that you're doing that. Praying for your neighbors is the most you can do. I don't like the phrase that our culture has made normal, which is says, well, I can pray for you. That's the least I can do. No, that is the most you can do. If, if that was the least I can do, then I think that would make me think that the casserole that I took to you when you were sick had some life-giving power. Now, my potato casserole is really good, but it is not that good, let me tell you. And so prayer is so important, so important. The second way that we can neighbor is to care, is to care for our neighbors. Ways to care. One, pay attention. Pay attention. Talk less and listen more. James 1.19 says, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I don't know about you, but listening isn't always my first response. I like to talk. <laughs> Have you ever been talking to someone, though? And you just know that they're not really paying attention to what you have to say. They're not really listening. What does that communicate to you? How does that make you feel? To me, it communicates that they don't really care. They're ready to move on to the next thing or talk to the next person. Another way that you can show someone you care is by asking questions. Asking intentional questions to get to know someone shows interest and it, it gives you an opportunity to learn more about that person. Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. I want you to grab a partner if you have one uh, nearby or do this activity later, and I want you to practice these two things. I want you to take turns. One of you, I want you to be the listener, and one of you um, in asking the questions. So you'll ask the questions, and then you'll listen to their responses, and then vice versa. I want you to take turns doing that. So do that for a minute each and see how it feels. Um, to be on the receiving end of someone really paying attention to you. Asking questions shows that person that you care. There's an activity in the, in the book, The Nine Arts of Gospel Conversations. I have that right here. Um, or The Nine Arts of Spiritual Conversations. It's by Mary Shaler and John Creeley. It's one of my favorite books. Um, but they do this cool activity when it comes to asking questions. They say, um, look at your hand. And I want you to take some time today, too, to do this. But look at your hand. Come up with ten questions about your hand. Your hand is nothing new. It's something you see literally all the time and you use a million times a day. But have you ever stopped to ask questions about your hand? Y'all, I've done this in many groups, um, this activity, and I'll tell you that um, I have heard some really thought-provoking questions come from this activity, honestly. Um, and so it, it's exciting to be able to come up with uh, new ideas to be able to get us to think. During quarantine, um, we also noticed another great way to care for our neighbors, which was giving. I don't know if it was the same in your part of the, the world or the country, but there was a toilet paper shortage in South Carolina, at least in Columbia. And I would spend, I would go to many, many different stores to find toilet paper. Well, my next door neighbor, um, her and her husband are elderly. And so they stayed in the house. And um, one time she mentioned to me that she 
couldn't find toilet paper or was running out or, or was getting close to running out. And so I had an extra pack that I had found, and so I just put that in her mailbox. Well, a few days later, she texted me and she said, go check your mailbox, I put you something in your mailbox. And she was making masks um, just for her friends and family, and she had made me two masks and had put those in my mailbox. And so giving is a way to show someone that you care and that you're thinking about them. I also um, had went to Sam's Club, and it's a big, um, you can get a stuff in bulk, food in bulk, and I had bought this huge thing of chocolate chip cookies in quarantine. Have no reason why I bought that huge thing of chocolate chip cookies. I certainly didn't need to be eating those myself. So when I was baking, I just would bake extra, and I would just take those around to our neighbors um, just to share and show them that I cared. Another way to care, to show your neighbors that you care, is by tangibly meeting a need. I had another neighbor that lived down the road, down the street, and um, she was taking care of her, um, her parents who were elderly, and she had some health issues herself, and so she was not able to mow her grass. I have a healthy 16-year-old son who mows our grass, and so I asked him, would you mind mowing her grass when you mow our grass? And so he gladly did that. Um, and so that was a, a tangible way that we could meet a need for a neighbor. And so maybe you have a neighbor who um, is elderly or who has health problems. And especially during the pandemic, maybe there's a way that you can show you care by taking care of some of those everyday chores um, to help them in that way and to show that you care. Y'all, there's really no wrong way to care for your neighbors. It just takes a vulnerability from yourself and a step of faith for you to go out and do this. And it also takes follow through for you to continue that relationship. You never know what God will do through you and it's important to remember that you are the hands and feet of Jesus to those within your sphere of influence. There's a few great opportunities that I've noticed and recognized um, in a person's life that will give you an opportunity to care and it really makes a huge impact. Four ways. One is the birth of a baby. You can start a meal train for that family. You can... Um, give them diapers or whatever way that you can show them that you are caring, you can care for them during that time. The second is a loss of a job. The third is a family member in the hospital, especially during COVID. Not all, you know, most people can't go into the hospital room to see these family members. So there's a lot of loneliness there. And the fourth is when a family member passes away. Being present during those times is really, really important. What are some specific ways that you show someone you care? Write those down today. I want to look closely at Ephesians 4, 32, because it gives us three practical ways that we can also care for other people. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So we can be kind we can be com compassionate, it says tenderhearted, and we can forgive. Y'all, people are going to do something, whether it's a miscommunication or they intentionally do something that you don't like, that's going to happen as you build a relationship. But it's important to do the biblical thing, which is to confront them and to, in a loving way and to forgive them, to talk it out. A lot of times we run from conflict. But my motto is you run towards conflict so that it doesn't follow you later. The third way that we can neighbor is to share. There are a lot of reasons why people don't share the gospel with people within their sphere of influence. But I've identified a few that I want to talk about today. Um, one reason Christians say that they don't share the gospel is because they don't know any lost people. 
Now, I know some of you may be thinking, what? There's a lot of lost people around me. Um, but there are some people who, who don't see the lost people around them. And that's part of what I want you to walk away with this today from this breakout session is seeing with God goggles on, meaning the, see how God sees those people around you with spiritual eyes because there are lost people around you. There are people far from God who are in your sphere every single day. Another reason that people might not be comfortable sharing the gospel is because they're not comfortable sharing their own story. Y'all, God has changed our lives. And with that, he has gifted us with a beautiful story of transformation. And that story reflects his glory. Our stories are great because it shows God's mercy. It shows um, how when we have trials and we've passed through them, that he was holding our hand and making us stronger. He has gifted us with non-judgmental and unconditional love in our story. Your mess has been turned into a message that God wants you to tell the world. When was the last time you shared your story with your children, with your spouse, with your parents, or with any, anyone within your sphere of influence? In the Nine Arts of Spiritual Conversations, again, I want to reference this book, the authors, uh, Shaler and Creeley, they share a very easy idea of how you can write your story. I want to read it to you because I feel like it's really impactful. Every year, movie producers filter through hundreds of screenplays to find the next great film. To get their attention, writers create a simple plot description with an emotional hook. It's called a log line. Here's an example. A young man and woman from different social classes fall in love aboard an ill-fated voyage at, at sea. Can you think of what movie that is? If you said Titanic, you're right. The screenwriters have found that a clear, concise logline is essential to stimulate interest in their story so that studio executives will give the pivotal invitation of, tell me more. One of the simplest faith stories in the Bible is found in John 9:25 when it says, "One thing I do know. I was blind and now I see." I'll give you my log line as an example. For me, before I knew Jesus, I was hopeless and I was lonely. But after meeting Jesus, I found purpose. Try to find one word or a phrase, very short phrase, that easily identifies what your life was like before Christ and what your life is like now when creating your log line. So what I hope you'll do is this week, I hope that you will create your own log line so that you can share that with those within your sphere of influence. Another reason I have found that I believe people don't share their faith or the gospel is because maybe they don't feel comfortable in sharing God's story. If you had the life-saving vaccine for sin, wouldn't you want to give it to those you love? Well, I'm here to tell you that you do have the life-saving vaccine for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. And so sharing his story with those in your sphere of influence is like giving them that vaccine. Y'all, the pandemic has moved us outside of the walls of our church. A lot of churches are actually meeting in parking lots. We meet in our backyard. Um, and so it's the perfect time for us to begin neighboring, for us to start investing in those relationships with those within our sphere of influence. 
there was a lady who came up to me one time after I spoke on neighboring, and she said, Melanie, I've lived in, beside my neighbor for 15 years, and I am so ashamed to say that I never learned her name. And I said, don't be ashamed of that because I bet she doesn't know your name either. But don't wait any longer. Go and meet her today. And I implore you with the same thing. Don't wait any longer. Use this opportunity to neighbor today. Thank you.